know, Kayla came and told me what they were going to do for fathers, and uh, she's like, we're, we got this bolt that we're going to give out. And I said, what's it look like? And Not a bolt. I know a lot of guys are holding their tongues, like, we just appreciate the gift. But if you have your Bibles this morning, I go ahead and invite you to turn with, turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15, one of the most well-known parables, one of the most well-known stories uh, in the Gospels, for sure. And like so many others, I have uh, great examples of, of fathers. I had a great father. I had a great grandfather. Um... My father taught me a lot of stuff about what it means to be a, a husband, what it means to be a man. Uh, he, he stayed at the same company for well, all my life. And he got fired one day. He was getting reinstated and all that fun stuff. But he lost his job for about a year. And he came home. He was uh, upset, of course, but he didn't throw anything or punch anything. Like he, he was calm, collected, but he was upset, you could tell. And from that day forward, he, he showed me what it means to be a provider as well. Because he, he started working two jobs to provide for us. And so he would leave at 6 in the morning, go to his first job, leave the first job, come home to the second job, get home about midnight, wake up, do it again, did that for about a year. And he taught me the importance of being a provider. How it's not, uh, even, you know, Kayla works an hour or two and, and all that fun stuff, but it's my duty as, as the husband to be a provider and make sure that my family's taken care of. And, I, and she's my equal. I, I don't consider her any lesser of me. But it's my role that God has given me as the man, as, as, as the man in the relationship. And so he taught me that. I had a grandfather who uh, every time we went over, Kayla knows, we talked about the Bible. Uh, his favorite person was Peter. And he passed away from COVID, well, not from COVID, but during COVID. And uh, so I know he's up there bothering Peter today. I know he's bothering Peter, and I feel so sorry for Peter. because He's got a lot of questions. But I had good men in my life. And so men that I, I even look up to my pastor still, I still consider him my pastor, someone who taught me the Bible and raised me to be the person and the man that I am today. And I realize not everybody had that. Not everyone had a good Christian home or, or men to look up to to show you what it was like to be a man. And some of you are trying to be the best men you can in spite of the father you had. And so I want us to look to Luke chapter 15 because it provides us, regardless of who you are or what you've done or where you've been, it provides us a good example of the kind of father that you can have. You may not have had the best father, but you can. And Luke 15 is a parable, so that means it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, a, he a heavenly re re uh, relevance. But it shows us the characteristic of God that is available to each and every one of us today. And so we'll start in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And so Jesus is speaking, he's, he's talking to the people who are hearing him. He said in verse 11, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto, him, unto them his living. Now in this time and day, uh, an inheritance was an important thing. Yesterday, me and uh, Kayla went to our home church for their youth day. I was used in a skit along with my father and my younger brother. If y'all have seen Devin, you know he's a foot taller than me, so I can't say little brother. He's my younger brother. And so we, we were using a skit, and me and Devin were going back and forth to Alvin Dad about our inheritance. Because we, he was the father, and we were the children receiving our inheritance. And so me and Devin were giving him a hard time because we don't really look forward to anything, right? We don't really think we're going to get anything that's not ours to get. It's mom's to spend. That's how I think about it. But in that day, an inheritance was a very important thing. It was something that would be passed down to the sons. And if you were the older son, which is a good son to be, you get two-thirds of the property. You get a double portion back in Deuteronomy chapter 21. And so the older brother, the older son in this story, receives two-thirds of his father's property. The younger son would receive a third of it. But what you're doing when you come to your father and say, will you give me my inheritance early? You know what you're doing? You're killing off your father. Because you would not receive that inheritance until you inherited it when it passed away. And so for you to come and say, I want my inheritance because I want to get far away from you. I don't want to be under your control or under your roof anymore. I would just like to get my things and go. It's a very insulting thing to do. It's a very, very hateful thing, honestly, to someone who has raised you and provided for you. 
But nevertheless, that's what he says. Give me my portion. Give me my third of my inheritance. And so the father does something very interesting. Guys, he doesn't backhand him. He gives it to him. Heartbroken as he is, I'm sure, he gives him, actually gives both of them their inheritance. And so what that would mean, it wasn't a whole lot of lump sum. It would have been, in our day, goats and chickens and cows and land and maybe some servants and things like this. His property. And so in verse uh, verse 13, not many days after the younger son gathered all together. Now that word gathered has the idea, yes, of gathering it, but it also has the idea of turning it into cash. Turning it into money, into things that you can, into currency. And so he takes everything his father's given him, he turns it, he liquidates it, and he starts going off. He says in verse 13, he took his journey into a far country. And there he was, he wasted his substance with wasteful living, would be the idea. His father did not instill money management skills in this young man. So he takes his inheritance what his father has worked for, what his father has built up over time, what his father has accumulated, he has taken it and he wasted it all. We don't know how, how we don't know if it was a few days, if it was a few, few weeks, a few months, we don't know how long it took him, but he didn't save it. He didn't establish an emergency fund. He didn't establish any Roth IRA or 401k. He didn't do any of that. He just spent it all. And when you're younger, you understand how you can do that. When you have people come into your life where you're responsible for them, when you get married or you have children, you realize, I can't do that anymore. I have to provide for them. I have to take care of them. I have to make sure that they're going to be taken, you know, taken care of if I was to pass away. And so he spends all he has in wasteful living. In verse 14, after he spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So he spends everything that he has, and all of a sudden, COVID strikes. Hailstorm comes, and he's got nothing. People ask sometimes, how much money should you have in an emergency fund? Enough to cover your insurance deductible. That's how much you should have, for sure. We had uh, our, our roof got uh, hail damaged a couple months ago, and we got it replaced, and I was looking over the finances, and, and I, I always heard Dave Ramsey, you have $1,000 in your emergency fund. I disagree. You need to have your insurance deductible. What you are going to have to cover in case an air conditioner unit goes out, in case your roof needs your place, in case your car needs, you need to have your insurance deductible. This man didn't have it. And so tragedy strikes, a severe famine comes, and so he's, he's got no money, he's got no food, he's got nothing left. And so in verse 15, he goes and he joins himself to a citizen of that country in verse 15, and he sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. Now, if you are a Jewish person, a pig or swine is an unclean animal to you. It's offensive. It's something that, that is against your religion, for matter of fact. And so now his job, in order to survive, in order to feed himself, he has to go and feed an unclean religious animal to him. He's got to go clean, uh, feed the pigs. In verse 16, he would find, he wanted to have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Now, the idea of a husk, you can think of like a purple hole pea. Y'all remember hole in purple holes? You know what they look like before you hole them and pour your peas out? That's what you can think of. This husk is the only time it's ever used in the Bible. It actually, it's, it's kind of like a caribou. It's a carob husk, it's, so it's off a carob tree. Only time it's ever used, and it's a little bit bigger version of a purple hole pea. And so, if you were, uh, they were they were cheap to get, so you could buy them. They were real cheap, so people use them as animal feed. But if you were real poor, you would eat them. And so here is this man, very poor, looking to eat his own feed that he's given to the pigs. What a different condition that he was in than when he started. It's amazing to me how many people think that once I go away from God, I can do whatever I want to do. You're right, you can. You can do whatever you want to do. You can live it up, you can spend it up, you can party it up, you can do whatever you want to do, but you will have consequences. God will not just let you go and, and have, it, have it your way. This isn't Burger King. He's going to send the consequences. You're going to receive the consequences that you have, and if you spend everything you have, 
Tragedy is going to come. Famine is going to come. Sickness, illness, disease, they're going to come. And if you're not ready, you're going to have to weather the consequences of your own actions and your own decisions. That's for everybody out here. And so here he is in a, in a pig pen, feeding the pigs, looking at their own, uh, their own feet as if, as if it's appetizing. And he comes to himself in verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Here he is, fattening the pig, starving himself. He says, even the servants, those little hired hands, those workers that are at my father's place, well, they have food and, and abundance of it. And so he decides, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go back to my father. Verse 18, I will arise and go back to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And so in verse 20, he arose, he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him, and had compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. So what this idea is, is just a, a, a scene of compassion. Now, the son would be someone who worked on the farm, it would be someone who tended to the animals and walked in the gardens and all this. And so for the son to leave, his father's now down a man. And so here his father is probably doing a little bit of the chores and doing some of the work. But at the same time, he's looking off for his son. Doesn't know if his son is dead. Doesn't know if his son is, uh, is okay or if he's injured. Has no clue. And so every day he's looking and longing for his son to come back. And every day he's looking and he's longing. And for one day, his son comes. And when his father sees him a great way off, the father goes. And what does he do? He runs. He had compassion. He ran. The idea of falling on someone's neck, just an embraceful, we would think bear hug today where you run and you pick someone up. You're so happy to see them. You're kissing them. You're loving them. You're so happy to see that your son who... You didn't know if it was dead or injured or hurt. It's back home. And so verse 21, regardless of this embrace, the son's going to continue. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, in verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the, cat, the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be married. Now, why does he do this? In verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. You want to talk about characteristic of God? Here it is. Here is the char uh, characteristic of God. Someone who provided everything in the Garden of Eden. And yet we wanted to do our own thing. I really think in America we're, we're getting to the point we have too many rights. Right? We have the right to do whatever we want to do. Guys, you can do whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. But that lifestyle is not going to lead to prosperity. That lifestyle will only lead to destruction. It will only lead to the pig pen. Why? Because we have a God-shaped void in our hearts and in our lives, and we can plug that with anything else we want to. Whether that is alcohol, whether that is drugs, or whether that is partying or pornography, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you can keep plugging it, and it will not work. We were made for a relationship. You see it in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, God came walking in the garden. They had a relationship. They walked together. They talked together. God made us for a relationship. And we were the ones who said, I'm good. I don't need it. I don't want it. Just give me what I, what I, what I need. Give me what, I, what I've deserved, what I've earned, and let me be. And God doesn't fight it. He says, if you want to go away from me, that's fine. You can go away from me. I don't want you to. I've never seen a father that wants their son to leave. Sometimes it's better for the son to leave. I've never seen a father want. It breaks their heart. 
Others, when your son leaves, it breaks your heart. I talk to parents who their child are, are disobeying and going in different ways, and it breaks their heart. I talked to a few months ago, I talked to a father on the phone who his son is doing all kinds of terrible things, and it broke his heart. But the parent says maybe it's good for him to do that because one day he'll finally learn the consequences of his actions. And that's what God says. He says, you need to understand there's a consequence. And he tells us the consequence in his word. He says, you're going to go to a life of destruction. You're going to be turned over. It'll never please you. It'll never settle you. And yet, so often we think it does. And it might for a little time. A little while, it might feel good. And it, it, it might last for a little while. We might have a lot, a lot of friends. But when you hit rock bottom, your friend will desert you. Your money is gone. The drugs won't touch it. Alcohol won't touch it. Girls or boys, they won't touch it. And it, it, it will not fill the void that we have naturally inside of us. And in that moment, it's how you respond. You can choose to get angry and say, I'm going to do it. You can choose to get mad at the world or mad at life and say it's all everyone else's fault. Or you can say it's my fault. And you can come back to the Father. And I want you to understand, none of us have the righteousness. None of us, none of us are worthy to come back to the Father. Right? When we come back to God, we do not come back and say, here I am, Lord, take me as I am. No, we come back and say, Lord, I am sorry. Because I am not worthy to even be on your doorstep. But if you allow me, Lord, forgive me of this. I, I, I don't want to live this life anymore. He accepts us not as righteously as we need to be. He actually accepts us as an heir, as an adopted child into the kingdom of God, into the family of God. He says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And we're not worthy of any of them. But this characteristic of a loving father is everything about God that is available to us today. We come waltzing in from our sinful lifestyle, broken and in despair, and God says, I will take you back. Now, there's something that you have to do. You have to realize your condition, and you have to leave that lifestyle behind. First Corinthians says, you, when you come to Christ, you're a new creator. You have to take off the old man and put on the new man. You're not to be the same as you were before. So, uh, not conform to the world being transformed by the Holy Spirit and the renewing of your mind. We're not to be the same. You can come to the Father and the Father will accept you back, but under one condition, you have to give it over to Him. You say, Lord, I have, I have sinned before you. I have sinned before heaven. I have sinned before, uh, before, before everyone. I have sinned and I need to be forgiven. And when you do that, you come, you say, Jesus, I want to make you my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Here's what happens in verse, uh, verse 22. Now, the son comes back, and he just wants to be a servant. Right? He says, let me work for food. Let me work for pay. Let me, let me just work. And the father brings the best robe and puts it on him. He puts a ring on his hand, and he puts shoes on his feet. He brings the fatted calf in verse 23. They kill it, and they have a party, basically. They have a celebration. He said, let us be merry. Why? Because in verse 4, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found, and they can't be married. That's the idea of God. Second uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 said, he says to the Ephesians, but you who are dead in your sin and trespasses are what? Make alive with the Spirit. We were sons, we were children of God who were dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, but God makes us alive through the Holy Spirit. That's one thing He gives you. When you come to Jesus, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And He doesn't stop there. If, if, if God was to stop at salvation, that would be plenty. I get amen to that. If, if He stopped at salvation, that was the last blessing we ever got, that would be enough. But He doesn't stop there. He continues to bless us, just like the Father who puts the best robe on, who puts a a ring on his hand. He puts shoes on his feet. The Lord continues to bless us and to bless us abundantly. 
We look at the character of David, King David, who sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, but God was abundantly uh, gracious to him. He kept on blessing him. And if you look at your own life, you can echo this and say, the Lord continued to bless me even though I was sinful and didn't deserve it. He continues to bless me out of his abundant grace. Now I want to talk about who he's talking to. And if you back up real fast to chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, let's see who he's talking to. Because this is a story. He's using it as a lesson. So chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Then drew near unto him all the public and the sinner, sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man received uh, sinners and eats with them. And so that's when Jesus begins telling these parables. So the sinners and the publicans, those are tax collectors, those are prostitutes, those are people who religiously we would say are out- outcasts. Those are the people that you wouldn't find in the temple, you wouldn't find them in the courtyards or, or talking to rabbis. These were the people whose society and religion had outcast them and said, You're not welcome here. They were the ones that came to Jesus. But the second group of people are those who were holy rollers, the Pharisees, the scribes, those who knew what the Bible, their law, said, what the Old Testament had to say. These were the two groups that came to Jesus. And so Jesus begins teaching these people. In three parables, he says, he's, guys, the first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. He says, basically, the farmer has so many sheep, he loses one, he's not going to just allow it to leave, he's going to go and find it and bring it back to the herd. The second one would be uh, the lost coin. He talks about a, a woman who has lost one of her, uh, basically a piece of jewelry. She searches the whole house, and when she finds it, the farmer and the woman, they both rejoice together at the end of the story. And at the end of the third parable, the one we just looked at in verse, uh, chapter 15, I believe it was verse 24, what would they do? They began to marry. They were celebrating. So this is the same ending as the other three parables, but Luke through Jesus, records one more thing beginning in verse 25. That is the idea of the older brother. It says, Now his son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. The servant said unto him, Your brother is is come, and your father hath hath killed a fat calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he, being the brother, was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgress I at any time by your commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid, a baby goat, that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured your living with harlots, thou hast killed him for him the fatted calf. He said unto him, Son, you are with me forever, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now we have one more character to the end of this parable that we didn't have in the other two. And that is that of the older brother who comes in after a long, hard day's work to a bunch of music and dancing and celebration. And through a servant finds out that his younger brother has come home. And not only that, you're an older sibling, you can identify with me. The parents are throwing a party for the younger sibling because they've come home. And I, I identify with the older brother. What am I, chopped liver? What am I? You didn't invite me to the party, you didn't even tell me my brother was home. And he starts thinking back in the past, well, well, well dad never gave me a fatted calf. He's never thrown me a celebration. He's never even given me a goat, which would have been substantially less of an animal. He said, you didn't give me a goat. You, you killed a prize cow that we have been feeding and nurturing and fattening. You killed that cow for my brother who left you, who deserted you and wasted everything? So that's not fair. And so that comes out and he says, it was necessary that we should be married. Why? Because your brother, your younger brother was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is now found. Now, what's the point? Well, he's talking to two groups of people, and these two groups of people are in the Bible. They're in who he's talking about, and the younger brother and the older brother. And the idea of the Pharisees, the younger brother, should have never been allowed back into the house. 
in the parable, the Pharisees and the scribes are the older brother. And in the parable, the, Pharise- uh, the, the tax collectors and the harlots and the prostitutes, all of those, they were the younger brother. And so Jesus is telling a story here, and he says those that are outcasts, those that have run away from God, no matter how far they've gone or what they've done or how much they've spent, they are always welcome into the kingdom. They're always welcome back to God. Why? Because our God is the compassionate God who loves like a father loves, who has compassion and mercy like a father does or a father should. And the right response from the older brother should have been to rejoice. In the other two parables, you see that at the end, the farmer comes, he finds his sheep, he comes back and he rejoices. The woman who searches for the coin or for the lost piece of jewelry, she finds it and she rejoices because she found it. And so the lost brother comes back and they're celebrating, they're rejoicing, and the older brother is angry. And so many times I've seen churches who do this and I've seen Christians that do it as well. We try to limit who can come and do the kingdom of God. We say, you have to change X, Y, Z. You have to change your life. You have to change your drug habit. You have to change da 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 You have to change before you can come to Jesus. Jesus never says that. He says, you can come unto me. Now, you do have to change when you get here. But you don't have to change before you come. We sing a song as, as a, a, a invitation. We say, come just as you are. That's what Jesus says. He says, come just as you are. I'll clean you up. I'll take care of it. But how many times we try to, to, to charge people into being saved? You, you have to fix this. You need to quit drinking. You need to quit. Did it. We need to get them to Jesus first. They have to come to Jesus first. I can try to clean somebody as much as I want, and I will never clean them up ready enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. My soap is never strong enough to get the sin off of them. Why? Because my soap didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. And so they don't need to be washed with my soap. They need to be washed with the blood of Jesus. So it's our job to bring them to Jesus. And when they come, we better be rejoicing. Because Jesus taught a parable that condemned the older brother here. He says, here's how you are reacting, you religious people, you Pharisees, you scribes, those who know the Bible, that know the law. Here's how you're responding. And you are mad that I am eating and drinking and being around people who are taking taxes, which are basically what would have been considered thieves and robbers. We think the same thing about us today. Those that take our money, those that take our taxes, those would have been those people who work in the tax collector's office, who take our money, who, they, they would be considered traitors in their day. Sinners who would be basically living a lifestyle of open sin. Those are the people who Jesus said, I came to save. Jesus said, if, you, if they weren't sick, they wouldn't need a doctor. And I, I didn't come to the saved. I didn't come to the, to the righteous. I came to those that needed a doctor. I came to those that needed a savior. I came to those my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I came to seek and to save the lost. We do not send search parties out to people who are found in their houses, do we? We send search parties out to those who are lost, who need to be found. The church is a search party. Who Jesus has said, go into the world, into your communities, into the highways, into the hedges, and compel them. Make it attractive. Make them want to come in. Make them want to be found. Find them and bring them into the kingdom. Don't clean them up first. Let Jesus do that when they get here. Well, how does that happen? Through the renewing of their mind. The Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit enters us and and it starts convicting us, and that's what Jesus even says. He says the role of the Holy Spirit is to be a guide, to be... A, a representative of Jesus in us and in the Holy Spirit, but he's supposed to be the leader, the someone who's going to convict us and lead us in, instru- in, in righteousness and instruct us in the ways to go, but he's to convict the world of sin. And so as we have that Holy Spirit living within us, as we sin, we're convicted of it. We learn what not to do. And through his word, we learn what not to do. It's God's job to clean the sinner. Not ours. 
Ours is to go and demonstrate the love of the Father. Jesus said, they will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And I love the way the story ends in verse 32. The Father says it was necessary that we should make merry, that we should celebrate and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. If you go down to chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus said it to his disciples. He ends the parable there in verse 32. He starts another parable in verse 1 of chapter 16. The story is left unended. And it's really beautiful because Jesus is allowing those hearers, his audience here, to decide, which brother are you? Are you the brother that needs to come home? Are you the son that needs to come back to the Father and return out of your sinful, out of your uh, wasteful living, out of your righteous living, and come back to the Father unto the household of God? Is that you? Are you the younger brother? Or are you the older brother who is holy, who is righteous, who is better than everybody, who doesn't think the younger brother should be welcomed back? Jesus leaves the Pharisees and the publicans to make that decision. And the conclusion, or really the invitation to end today for us is that same thing. Which younger brother, which older brother are you? Are you the older or are you the younger brother? Are you the older son or are you the younger son? Are you the person who needs to come out of your sinful lifestyle into the grace and the household of God to be adopted into the family of God? Are you someone who needs to get off your high horse and say, I am here for the kingdom of God and to advance it? Not to act as a gatekeeper, seeing who can be saved and who can come in. Which brother are you this morning? And I, I beg you, if you're that younger brother who is out in their lifestyle of sin and doing whatever they want to do and living it up for a time, if you're that brother, come in before the famine strikes. Come in while the Father is saying, you can still come home. You can still come. You can come unto me. You can come to the altar. You can come to the cross. Don't let it, and so often it does, don't let it get to the point where the famine knocks us on our knees. Come to Jesus before that. Choose him today. If you need to come home, Jesus is standing with arms wide open saying, I am ready to receive you. I am ready to forgive you. But you have to come home. Don't leave here this morning knowing you're sinner. Knowing that you, Jesus is not your Savior, and saying, I'll wait this one more day. If you need to be saved this morning, then we'll, after this prayer, we'll have an invitation, and you can make whatever decision you need to make. Let's go ahead and bow in prayer, and we'll move into an invitation. Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we bow before your throne this morning as we pause this service. And Lord, we look to this conclusion of this, of this parable. And Father, we realize that we have a decision to make. And some of us here may need to decide that we need to come into the kingdom and the family of God. That we need to step out of the world of sin. Step out of the world of selfishness, conceitedness, pride, arrogance. There may be some sins that we have hiding in our closets. And we need to leave that behind and come to the grace and be adopted into the family of, of God through the blood of Jesus. And Father, there may be some here today who act as gatekeepers. Father, allow us to remove that responsibility from our, uh, from our duty list. Allow us, Lord, as a church and as Christians to welcome people into the kingdom of God. And when they enter the kingdom of God, Lord, allow us to celebrate with the angels in heaven. Father, make us right today and allow your Holy Spirit to convict us of our need to respond this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please?